everyone. Good evening. Thank you for joining me again on another interesting episode of Bookish Reflections. And today is going to be very, very interesting because I have a very interesting guest. And um, if you have been following me, you know what I'm going to be talking about. I'll be talking about the environment. Every It's an issue. It's a global issue right now. And I feel like we should be having this conversation now, especially with the whole climate change crisis and all of that that is happening around us, even within our dear country, Nigeria. In case this is your first time joining me, this is Bookish Reflections, where I talk books with very interesting guests, basically X-ray social issues through the lens of really, really interesting books from very amazing authors. So thank you for joining me. Well, without much ado, I have a very interesting guest with me. His name is Gabriel Fanio. We have been friends for a very long time, well over a decade, and he shares this very big passion for the environment. And I felt that if I'm going to be talking about the environment, he's the best person to call. I said his name is Gabriel Fanio. He's an author, he's a copywriter, and an environment enthusiast, yes. Um, as we keep talking, I'm sure you'll get to know more about him. And so please don't go anywhere. Make sure you're sitting tight and getting ready for an amazing conversation. So let me bring Gabriel in. Gabriel, hello. Hey, hi, It's Gabriel Fanny, everyone. Yeah. I missed out something. I was just with colleagues in the university. I should have said that. I went to University of Ibado, great UI, like the greatest of the greatest. <laughs> and yes, we were in the same department, Department of English. And you know, we're so proud of that department. The part, that department has brought so many prominent literary people to the scene. Like, I feel so proud. We have the New York Shundaris to boast about and all of that. So Gabriel, it's so good to see you. Thanks for honoring my invitation. Anytime, it's been a long while. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's been a while, it's been a while. Thank you so very much. So, before we get down to business of discussing Helen Havila's book, Oil on Water, which is the book we are extracting together, how was your COVID lockdown experience? And how has it been? Now that they say we are in post COVID, so tell me about it. It was um it was a bit annoying though. I think that's really? just one word. Yeah, it was annoying, really. And it was annoying because um you had Nigeria trying to follow the world with what they were doing. While issues like these actually require separate targets, like you're not supposed to be doing what every other person is doing. You find out what works for you, yeah. and then you also uh, follow it. I don't think that. We should have done what we did. I feel like the period was a time for us to uh, think about the things that we can do better as a nation, look for internal solutions, and just roll and survive. You know, but we kept we the lockdown was almost annoying in the sense like you know, people told us yeah, and you well. not see them. So in America, when they did the lockdown and in Britain, they had everybody's address. They were taking food to people on their doors. Yeah, we don't even know where anybody is. So turned into I like, wanted to keep people locked down. It was it was annoying for me. Yeah, that's the most interesting part. I can imagine. Well, it was something many Nigerians were not used to or are not used to. Considering we are a population that live on our daily, daily earnings. And so to be locked up meant no food for you for as long as you were at home so definitely it wouldn't have worked but thank god we are alive and we can sit there sit down here and you know have a very wonderful conversation so gabriel thank you once again yes yeah, so let's not um go far far from what we are really going to be discussing today yes we have to discuss this book oil on water oil on water by helena Bila. and um tell me when you read it what was your first impression? How did you feel about the book? The first time we read it, we read it as one of the reading lists, right? If it's so right, we were, we were supposed to read it for an exam or a course, but then it was just um, getting to know about the environmental issues in Niger Delta and all. Mm -hmm. but the second time I read the book, I actually wanted to see what it was for, right? So we can say the first time I read it was to pass an exam, right? And then the second time, 
as when it was fractured so because we've had um stories my mom is from niger delta so yes i should have said that you have a yeah. part you have you're a part of the niger delta yes 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 i have and you can see the reality of life that um, the people live down there so i had some some context right but not as deep as um presented by uh, Elena Bila on Oil and Water, where he goes deep down into the creeks and brings forth um, issues for you to decide for yourself. Uh, they say the book is a work of fiction, right? But you look at yeah. it clearly, you see that it's faction, right? You would even think that you are reading something that looks like a, like a memoir, right? And it, it brings, it brings these, these things to life. You can see what is actually happening uh, in, in Niger and it, it, again, it draws a lot of emotion from from the reader. Mm. Yeah. In, there's the sorrow, there's the, there's a lot of emotion in, in, in that book and it, it actually brings you up to imagine what's happening in Nigeria. Yes, I really felt I am from the Niger Delta too. In fact, on both sides, my mom and dad are from the Niger Delta and it felt like I was I was I, I was being introduced to a part I never really okay I, I I have heard or I had heard about the crisis in the Niger Delta but when I had the opportunity to travel home it wasn't like you were I was visiting all of those really really badly affected areas so reading Helen Abila's book was kind of a shocker and not so much of a shocker because I got to see some of it on the news but you know when you are listening to the news you are just re- listening in passing. But reading Helen, Helen had a very unique way of making every scene, every page so vivid. And then your emotions are drawn in. You are, you are vested in it, you know. And it made me think as to how much the government has failed the Niger Delta. Or do you have an opinion otherwise? No, no, it's the same. Really. And when we mentioned, uh, we started this conversation by saying that my mom is from the Niger Delta, and you also said that you're from the Niger Delta. Both your parents. I think it's more than a Niger Delta conversation, and just like you said, it's a Nigeria conversation. So, everyone that's from Nigeria, and even everyone that's from Africa, it's something that, um, so the Niger Delta is, is sick, you know, the whole, the whole body is sick, right? Things are not going all well in one part of, of the country, it will affect the other part, like. Yeah. So it, it stay, it stay, and and I want you wonder that for something that has been uh, that long, for something that has been occurring that long, and we cannot still say that we've got the solution to it. It's kind of like scary, you know. Uh, like how long do you want to have a headache for? Right. The Niger Delta issues that existed since oil was found uh, in 1953, I, I think, right. And till now, we're not still close to the solution. It's um, it does beat your imagination. I mean, what do you think? Yes, it does beat my imagination, and that is why I think more than ever we need the likes of Helen Habila to use their this um, use their writing and their creative skills to continue to interrogate these issues. And speaking of Helen, back to the book. What do you think about the characters? The characters of Zach. The character of Rufus and all of that. I mean, these characters were were pretty much the, the we were reading about the Niger Delta Niger Delta through their eyes. I mean, through Zach and Rufus, who were just going to cover a story. So tell me about your overall feel of these characters. How well do you think Helen Habila portrayed them or developed them to push the story he wanted to push forward? I think we made use of a particular device and the stability of the that I wanted to come for. I think that mm-hmm. the choice of Zach and Rufus, uh, rather than just portraying the story from uh, from a layman's point of view, he wanted to do it from something that like a reporter's point of view. So yes. I think he wanted to, and again, I, I, I read, if you read a lot of reviews, a lot of people have a lot of things to say about it. Some people said it was. Not a good work of fiction. Like, of course, every book and people will always have different ideas. But I think what he wanted to do was to bring facts and fiction in it uh, together. And he did that very well with the choice of characters that he took. So rather than just telling the story from a bystander or the son of a mother or like a, a mom, he told the story from the reporting point of view. I think that was important. 
And it's all it's always in, it's also interesting that the book starts off, the book is wrapped around uh, an investigative adventure, like they were going to rescue a woman, right? They were going to rescue, rescue this wife of uh, of a British national who of course they didn't have. So there's this look of let's go and find something out. Let's go and check for ourselves. Let's go and see. So the reader to follow the uh, main characters on this journey through the creek and see reality for themselves. I, I think that's some kind of device that he puts up there. So you draw your own conclusions, right? Another thing that's clear about the book is that there are no simple answers. Uh, if you read the book, you find out that whether it's the militants that are worse or the soldiers that are worse, sometimes yeah. it's, it's madness, right? All through the things that the soldiers are doing, they are they are, they can be militants, right? Yeah. <laughs> they are all, the villagers caught to the middle, and just, just that, that suffering of people not knowing what to do or where to belong. It's it's a hard story, right? And, and that's that's the general thing that comes from it. And it's just to show it doesn't offer any simple solutions to, but it's just to show what it is and, and for everybody to, to make up their mind and do what they want. Yeah, and you talked about um, irony, and I was um, looking at it. The people thought that finding oil on their land was to be a source of blessing, but it's like finding oil on their land basically was their curse. Because when the oil was discovered, you saw the length and the extent to which the government went to convince them to um, let the government come and explore oil on, on the land and you could see the bribery and the exchange of money till it led to threats and all of that and they were first to basically live with it and at first it looked like okay maybe this is an okay thing you know it talks about the the flaring the fire they kept seeing symbolic of i think it's symbolic of the development that was to come to them they started getting television sets and all of that and all of that and all of a sudden, that blessing of oil, so to speak, became their curse. I want you to um, try to elaborate on how the government can ensure that something like this doesn't keep happening. I mean, how can people so blessed be the people who are living in abject poverty and all of that? If you were to advise the government on practical solutions to this what would you say wow um so i really don't know how sad answer that question but i'll take it anyway so it's um it's a, it's a, a critical situation because it it, uh, it involves one mystical concept called the land right there's a connection that people have with their land that Really, I don't think we can explain uh, on this call or, or, or on this show. And this is why, if you read yeah. the, fight, the fighting from uh, South Africa and all, right? If you steal my, if you take my car, you, you, you take it and then it's gone, right? If you take my cow and you kill it and you eat it, it's kind of like gone, right? But if you steal my land, I pass by that land every day. I see where I raised my children. I see, mm. I see where I met my wife. Yeah. I see where my forefathers live. I'll kill you. You cannot take that land and go to it. I will fight you with my last blood. And that's what, although again, everything kind of like has been vandalized. So something that begins with fighting for freedom now turns into uh, a mad play of people stealing and kidnapping and all sorts, right? But it's, it's the land. And you hear in America where a hurricane is coming and everybody's announcing that you should leave. And some people say they're not going anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> You just want to say that this is where they raised that they are, that where do they want to go? And again, you, you hear stuff like this is why banishing or banishment was a big deal. And you think that they're not banishing you now. <laughs> what is the mm. big deal? You are being uprooted from where from life as we know it. And this really and if you look at this from the surface, you think that there's some easy solution to it, but the answer is no. Because this thing has taken a lot of time to build and the problem didn't start over again, right? The solutions also will not be easy. 
But the first thing to do is to acknowledge that there's trouble in the Niger Delta, right? There's something about um, justice, there's something about the, the gift of the people and their land that needs to be reckoned with. There's some discussion, and there's just some acceptance of that fact that if something grows in my backyard, I'm entitled, I, I'm not supposed to, it's not supposed to be a curse, right? Just like you said, that I have something that is good, and that should be good, not just to you, that should be good to me. Now, how that works, and I've had a lot of arguments, right, that Niger, uh, the federal government is giving out the private formula, and they are contributing money, and they have done the NPC and all of all that. There's still more to be done, right? Like I said, what's good for you? Nigeria is earning uh, exchange of oil, right? And it's good for you, it's good for the country. You have to, you have to, you are responsible to make that also good for me. And that's just what I'll say uh, at this point. Like, you have, we have to find a way. And there are ways, right? There are ways around these things. There are ways. So we know what the issues are, right? And we just need the political will, we just need the time, we just need the patience. To actually dig down into this thing that enforce some of these laws. It could take time, trust me, but it can start. Yeah, and then now back to our topic. In the book, there was a in fact many pages of the book, Helen Habila described the environment. I mean the oil on the water as it were and the fish that were dying the source of livelihood of these people taking away from them many of them migrating from the villages searching for better pastures in the city and all of that how concerned now that's actually the topic that we we're going to be talking how concerned should we be because what i see is a lack of concern because if you are concerned about something if our government is concerned about anything you will see it in the action but it seems as though actions are not there to show that there is any level of concern so really how concerned after reading helen habila's book that was a question i began to ask myself how concerned should we be about our environment So the conversation about the environment goes um, way back even before man um, man was made and there's this argument that the environment can live without man, right? It's man that cannot live without the environment. So the environment existed uh, before before man came. And if you check with every um even if you go to the Bible, you got created man last, right? And if we check all of all the eon era and all that, you see that the dinosaurs came and all these species came and Man actually were the last to come. And that's why the environment is important to us. Apart from the physical structure, the environment gives us some sense of belonging, like, like I explained earlier, and we're supposed to be uh, concerned about our environment. The, the mix, though, uh, why, and people are care about their environment. What, what, what's happening here is, is the choice, right? And we can use the lockdown as a very simple analogy for this. So COVID-19 was dangerous, right? And it's still dangerous. But there's something more dangerous than COVID-19, and it's called hunger, right? So you lock down the people, you, you, you stop them from making the daily living, all to avoid the death that will come from COVID-19, while that lockdown itself is a form of death. And so that's the choice between the devil and the deep blue sea. And that's why it looks like Nigerians don't care about the environment. They just don't have an option, right? And I'm not saying this loosely. I'm saying that if you want someone to flush the toilet, put water on the in the wash wash hand basin. Don't accuse someone of you are always not flushing, but water to flush the toilet is like five miles away from from the house, and you're saying why why don't you always flush? I'm not sure anybody wants to destroy the environment uh, as in Nigeria now as we're living. If we create normal waste disposals, if we create alternatives to firewood, if we have access to pipe on water. Nobody will say, ah, environment, I don't like you, I'll, I'll destroy you, I'll destroy you, and all that. So it comes from in trying to live and in trying to make, uh, in trying to survive, many people tend to do things that are actually not right. And again, you may not blame them. That's what I'll say. I, I don't know if that, does that answer the question? Yes, it does. But I also have a concern. 
the concern is that I don't think a lot of people are well educated about the impact their activities have on the environment. And I think that if we do have a proper, if we do have proper education on it, I mean, just look around on your streets. Just walking on the streets of Lagos alone, there are so many things that are quite that you see that are quite appalling. The indiscriminate use of plastics and the way we just, you know, dispose of them. And I feel like there is still a nonchalant attitude. I mean, everybody can make the choice of not throwing what they eat on the floor right so i think what i do agree with you that a lot of times the incentives are not there i also feel that people are not seeing their own personal responsibility as such you know and so that is why we have the environment so polluted and so messed up basically and that has transcended to government because government i think they came from the whoever is in government came from the citizenry we are our own people represented there, I, I, I mean. So if there was this education that they had before ascending the corridors of power, probably things will change or there might be some form of change. What do you think of that? I mean, that's how I feel. I don't know. <laughs> what, what's your take on it? Okay, so I do you can't really think about it, you are trying to survive, right? And talking about the people, talking about the government, it's a, it's a difficult one here. So look at, and then again, I, 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 I don't know if we should go this way, but look at the, the woman um, in the village who uses firewood. What can she do? What education do you want to give her? She burns, she cuts trees, and she uses them to make fire. That's carbon, that's environmental degradation, and all that. What can she do to that? What level of education do you think you, you, you want to give her? Okay, <laughs> and then you can tell her that, okay, immediately you finish cooking, you put it out, and don't allow it to burn over, right? So I'm, I'm talking about the opportunities to live and, and, and the just what is available. You know, life would always be. Life will always be life, right? And what, it's what's available to you that, that, that you use. You will not even think about a clean environment if you are trying to survive. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. So education is important. And there's this, there are some parts of this environment that we drive cars, right? And then we go to work, right? And then I just turned on my gen, right? And then that, those, those are polluting the environment, right? Do, do I need, I, I need education too, right? Are you too, right? yeah okay so um you do have a point and i do agree with what you have said um but let's also look through the through the events that happened in the book how the the issue of kidnapping started because the whole thing started with the wife of an ex expatriate, Isabel, being kidnapped and everybody was searching for her. So whatever happens to our natural em environment also affects our social environment. And out of this negligence of the government, and even, I wouldn't say the people are totally innocent, out of whatever negligence from whoever, militancy sprung up, death unnecessary death because when you read the book and you see the way um villages were invaded by soldiers and militants and all of that you get the sense of fear the the the, the environment is is already toxic with fear you know so this our environment this our natural environment still has a lot to do with our social environment and every other environment or don't you think so Oh, because I, I mean, that was how I could kind of um, put the two together. When the environment, I mean, the natural environment is not well taken care of. Don't you think it also affects every other aspect of life? I remember we were having the discussion and you said, a discussion and you said, the man needs the environment to survive. And so when the environment is not there, it's like we are losing the source, our source of survival, right? Exactly. Like, like you said, you cannot separate the environment from other parts of the world. 
one. And the interesting thing is like um, where you grow up is actually um, going to play a big role in who you become, right? So if you go to water areas, the people are head of strangers. They don't see you. They, are, they don't just get to turn on it to go anywhere, right? And that's because of how they are grown. That's because of where they are raised, right? They don't make friends easily. Why? They've seen a lot of blood. They've seen a lot of people coming to kill. Uh, there are some, uh, I think in Kenya, they run long distance races and they always win. Why? Because the environment has hills. And so they train running on hills. And when you, when you go to buy something and you're always climbing hills, and you, you naturally learn how to run or how to beat it rather than someone who's living in the plane. So it's connected. And if you even go deeper into this environmental issue, you'll see that it's a social problem rather than even a physical problem or uh, a technical scientific problem. It's a social problem in the sense that it's people that cause it, right? It's caused by people, it affects people, and the people who cause it are not the people who suffer it, right? And if we tend to even take it over from just Nigeria and go to global warming, it's a big social problem, this global warming thing. And that's why when you hear some people not supporting global warming, you need to understand what they are talking about. So some countries have made a lot of wealth polluting the, the environment. And now they say everybody stops. You, you have made billions, you have built your cities, right? With global warming. And that's a me that I that, that I should stop. It, it, it's not like that. You have to change something. And that's why all these con con considerations of, and this is not me saying that global warming is good and that would be continue. I'm just saying that the people making, uh, polluting the environment sometimes are not even talking, it, right? It's one of the only layer we have. It's one the oceans we have are connected. So what one country dumps into the ocean can affect another country miles away, right? And when the ocean expands, the lowlands and all of all the people who live in the creeks, their banks will be overflowed, right? So someone is coming from someone else, affecting someone from someone else, someone has good stuff from the environment and saying everybody should stop. So there are social issues, real big social issues that people feel to get some people feel that it's injustice. And then you have the uh, group of people who say that the government is just trying to control all the force. But there's no such thing, there's no such thing as, as, um, as global, global, global warming. But there is, just that there are no easy answers. There are no easy answers. Yes. So um, while we're rounding up this chat, I would like us to quickly address something. Jack and Rufus in the book are representing the media. What do you think is the role of the media in all of this? Hmm, that's a that's an interesting question. Uh, there's a quote that I like to I like to start with, where someone says that if you, if you listen to the news, you are misinformed, and if you don't listen to the news, you are uninformed. Mm. You get to, to see that the news is a living thing. Right. And in the book, you see conversations where people say, don't believe everything you see in the news, right? Because the people who write these things, they are human beings. And it's one side of the story. I'm sure if Rufus writes, his writing will change from the experiences that he had rather than what he's been doing before, right? And there was this other view that you just saw. And again, I'm, the media, they're doing a great job, right? And then they, are, they put their lives at risk to, to do stuff. But they might have to really do more to, to, to present the truth because there's money going around. There's people that want to buy the truth. There's, there's, a, there's an agenda on ground. And who's paying the piper? He's the one that will be praised, right? And there's a lot of manipulation everywhere. And it's difficult to actually stand for truth. Let's, let's, let's just say, why was Rufus and Zach, why did they go after the... the, the uh, Floyd, the the why why too much? There was money, right? And again, we talk about the story, the story, the story. Without that kulele, do you think they would have been that dedicated? Do you, <laughs> think, do you know how many people get kidnapped every day that we don't even care about, right? And then for a few wealthy rich, he, he makes the news, and the woman's picture was everywhere. So. And then what, um, what this means is that we should be careful with the news, we should be careful with the media, and the media also should step up to do, uh, to do a better work than, than what they're doing. Because right now, conversation, people don't really believe what they hear, what they see again, and there's this discredit 
So fake news is not fake news. The, the whole fake news uh, thing has become a a talk. Everybody talks about fake news. Yeah. Yes, and it's a big problem. It's a, it's a big, big problem that, uh, and then fake news is it's still a problem when it's random conversations, right? Well, imagine if we don't believe what we hear from established journals and established papers. There's trouble, right? Because we know some of these things. We know that these um, these houses, some of them are owned by certain people who have their own agenda, right? You know the owners of this paper, and you know that this paper cannot publish anything that will damage the reputation of so, so, and so. So all of all these things, they, they fight to discredit the great job that the media guys are doing. So again, it comes with a sift, and this is where the individual must, you must educate yourself to know what is false, what has been pushed, and what it could have been. And, and this, this is why you don't just sit back and allow the news to come. This is why you also have to investigate news, right? And then see for yourself what you can take and, and, and what you have to you have to throw away. Yeah, so uh, the media has played a, a, a very interesting role. And um, I see that sometimes when they say this thing that it's bad news that sells, right? I think that what, if that is true, in Nigeria, the media should focus on good news. Sometimes focus on focus on good news. It's not just the bad news all the time. Bad news, bad news. Because that's what you want to tell. You know, you see the coverage of Boko Haram. You see the coverage of, and the coverage is very important. You are raising a very key question. The coverage is important because it's how the story is told that it will go down, and many people will have that at the back of their mind. So it's really important for us to hold um, to hold um, the media accountable, but the media cannot be held accountable, and they cannot do um, they can't do cool stuff if they are not funded, if they are not yeah. left, or if they are not left to their own free will. You saw the envelopes that were moving around and the politics that was being played in the fact for the because the person went here and the person it's just funny, right? So it's God help us all, man. <laughs> that, yeah, God help us. I think that's a good way to round up. Well, you know, another thing I saw in the book as we round up, because we really have to, is the shrine. That shrine in the book represents the role of religion. And that was the way I could see it. And I think we cannot put past this issue past our religious leaders. I feel like they have a role to play because the way the, the, the shrine became a home for the displaced villagers and all that, I think I was quite touched by it. And in that same shrine, somebody like Boma found a sense of purpose again. And even Zach, he felt like after all his struggles of life, that shrine was where he could, you know, basically take a rest from all of his travels and eventually you know what happened at the end not to give spoilers so that those who have not read the book can go and read the book so at the end of the day i also think that our religious bodies do have a role to play in educating and also we have helping to rehabilitate people who have been adversely affected by all of these things going on around gabriel thank you so very much before you go there's a question i always ask people who I chat with, especially when I meet friends like you. What is the book you think everybody must read before they die? Wow. Uh -huh. yeah. What book do you think everybody must read before they die? Well, I think that's a, that's a conceptual question because I think that books are, books are not the same for everyone. Like there's, there's this book that I think maybe Read and there's a book I think that guys read, there's a book I think that people studying in this read, there's a book that I think the readers should have to read. So, to give one book for the whole world, maybe I can talk about myself. Like, if you say what's the most interesting book that I've read, uh, I can give an answer to that. And is that, is that, is that okay? Okay, okay. But you're, you're okay. dodging my question, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> because I can like a book and, and someone might not like it. Uh, so yeah. I've always said that um, there's, there's this book I read. Uh, it was it was a very difficult book to put down. It's, it's, it's written by Ted Decker. The title of the book is Link. It, it's an amazing book. Link. Uh, it's yeah. Link. It's Link. 
I, I couldn't imagine how how someone wrote like that. It was it's an amazing book, and I think everybody should if you just check it out. You see, so what I'll do is people who say they don't like reading, people who say reading is hard. I just think you've not found your book, right? If you get a blink, you won't be able to drop it. Perfect <laughs> advice. Anybody who says that they don't like reading have not found, or that person has not found the book for them. So I do agree with you. I do agree. So just blink. I'm not going to recommend some chew and chipping and all of those. You said one now. You said one now. There's until the second hour show by Chino Achebe. If you want to see Achebe, if you read things from apart, you think things from apart is a good book, right? But it's a reply to the Torah part of that name, and it's a precise how plan. If you want to see the Achebe as a as a artistry writer and legendary stuff, read Anthony of the Savannah. Man, what, I didn't get that. Ant Hills of the Savannah. Oh, I think that's my least Achebe. Well, that's my least favorite of Achebe, actually. I Are you kidding me? Yeah, what I think so the first, first, Arrow of God second, any other thing third. Wow, wow. <laughs> so you yeah. see what I'm talking about, <laughs> recommendations, right? Antis of Savannah is, 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 is I'm talking about for, for brilliant and for legendary writing. Think all of us have it. Why, right? why is nobody talking about a man of the people? Well, and so we're talking about you see, we can talk about everything. We just have to choose. <laughs> I love Antuzo. I, I love her, 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 her. I love that book. Uh, but it's pretty amazing that there are new writers who are doing an amazing job of writing. And I'm so blown away by what people are writing, especially in the Nigerian literary scene. So this is me actually encouraging people who are not readers. You are missing. There are so many books you pick up right now and you are basically taken into another world. And yes, that, is my, that is one of the reasons why I'm doing bookish reflection. So people can see the amazing works of amazing authors that are doing yes. fantastically well. Yeah, on, on bookish reflection, I think this is a good place to also add the importance of reading a book. In, 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 in a straight line, you can connect it to looking at the stars. You know, looking at those stars, their lights have been shining for hundreds and decades and centuries that you've seen. When you pick a book, what we are doing is you are downloading an entire knowledge of thought. You're just downloading something, history, culture, stuff, and you are adding it to yourself. You know, really, people who don't read, right? You, you can't, you, they're not the major people that read, it's a lot that you're missing, and just to add to what what you're saying. So you're downloading something that looks like that took like 30 years to write. You're downloading it in two hours. You will be the same person ever again. Ever again. Yeah. That's a beautiful insight. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You no, know, I said Gabriel is an author and Gabriel, I still have your books. And uh, 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 you actually wrote on the environment <laughs> after tomorrow. Uh, wow. the day after tomorrow, I do have that, and empty barrels, empty wow. barrels. So, oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Yes, you wrote them very long, 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 very, very long time ago, but I still have them. That's the story I don't joke with my books. As long as it's my book, I will keep it. Thank you so much, Gabriel, for joining me today. I had fun. Thank, Thank you for extraying extrain these issues with me and, you know, basically on unlocking so many things in the world. Thank you so much. I hope when I call Thank you again, you will be ready because I'm definitely going to be calling you again. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So everyone, that was Gabriel Fanny on with me. He basically helped extray oil on water, a wonderful book, and I'm recommending it. Anyone who picks it is bound to um, basically have a good time. It's quite emotional, but really, really good, really, really good, because you are reading about the travel of a certain region of the country, and there is no how your emotions will not be aroused, especially to some form of activism 
all right so i can recommend this go pick it up anywhere books are sold and i can show i can assure you that you won't regret it well if you have enjoyed this episode of bookish reflections do not hesitate to click on that subscribe button put on the notification so that you get straight up updates when i upload any video and don't forget to like yes please do like this wonderful page very much thank you for watching bye